So please, you can join us for this event celebrating Felicia Rice and Moving Parts Press. I'm Rachel Nelson, Director of the Institute of the Arts and Sciences, and I'm going to help facilitate this afternoon. But don't let that fool you into thinking I'm solely responsible for this event. Teresa Mora and Jessica Pigza from the University Library Special Collections very much deserve this credit. And I thank them for their thoughtfulness and clarity in organizing this gathering. Thanks too to Chloe Murr and our friends in University Relations Special Events for working in the background. As I'm sure you are aware, Felicia has had a long and illustrious career as a book artist, typographer, letterpress printer, fine art publisher, and educator. She also spent decades as part of the UC Santa Cruz community as educator and staff, so Felicia needs little introduction to many of us. She's collaborated with artists, poets, and theorists to make and publish beautiful books through Moving Parts Press for 30 years. And you can correct me if those weren't all with Moving Parts Press, but we can get there. These books incorporate vivid image text combinations and creatively delve into the tangled issues of our times from questions surrounding identity to the sustainability of our planet. Her creations can be found in collections near to our heart, including UC Santa Cruz Library Special Collections and other nationally prestigious organizations, including the Whitney Museum of American Art. As Felicia will tell you a little more about, in August, devastation struck Moving Parts Press as it did so many in our communities. The CZU lightning complex fire destroyed the press and Felicia's backlog of books, all those beautiful objects lost. Our communities have a long way to go to even begin to protest this and the other traumatizing events of the last months or years. I will not set the time scale. Yet while we struggle to grapple with ways forwards through the fires, floods and droughts, as well as the pandemic and the political and social struggles that define these times, Felicia and Moving Part Press provides a model and a beacon of possibilities. As we'll hear from Felicia and her collaborators, the press has risen from the ashes. Books and collaborations proliferate, and Felicia continues to emphasize the role for arts in troubled times. So I'll turn it over to Felicia in a moment to tell us more about how that has all happened in the last six months and to show us some examples of her collaborative projects. And then I'm thrilled that Jennifer Gonzalez, Gustavo Vasquez, TJ Demos, Angel Dominguez, Hannah Kazima, and Amalia Mesa Baines have joined us to talk about their collaborations with Felicia and each other. I hope those of you who are in the audience will also join the, the conversation. If you have questions or comments, please do add them into the Q&A. But for now, Felicia, do you want me to go ahead and bring it into series of slides? Sure, yes, please. <clears throat> Here we go. All right, my first slide. Um, you can see there I'm at a printing away uh, in the picture, a beautiful rainbow uh, and some of the molten lead that's left of my type on the burn site and new broadsides being printed uh, to benefit fire recovery. So I'm gonna talk about each of those things and I'm going to show the books that the collaborators, who my friends who are present today were a part of. Um, let me start out uh, with the next slide. In 1977, I founded Moving Parts Press in downtown Santa Cruz, where I entertained clients and authors, artists and students for over a decade before moving the press to the mountains. My letterpress shop and my entire archive of artist books was destroyed in the CZU Lightning Complex fire in August 2020. I've relocated to Mendocino and with the help of over 700 supporters thus far. I am establishing Moving Parts Press in my childhood home. Next. I think of myself as a printer, an artist, and a publisher. As a printer, my job is to confront complex issues and render my response to them in book form. As an artist, my job is to do so with profound integrity. As a publisher, my job is to make these issues public. As printers have done every decade since Gutenberg, I'm here to argue for a more just society. Next. With one foot firmly planted in the 19th century and the other in the 21st, I employ traditional typography and bookmaking methods together with digital technology to bring the flexibility of screen-based design to the texture and history of the letterpress printed page. Next. 
Before the fire, my letterpress print shop was located on a ridge in the Santa Cruz Mountains above the Pacific Ocean. My studio was the ground floor of my home and fit me like a glove. Next. Over the course of 45 years, I had built a complete letterpress print shop with a beautiful Victoria Platin press and two Vandercook proof presses. I had a very fine collection of 200 cases of metal type of the highest quality, irreplaceable, inherited from the fine printer Sherwood Grover. Next. Moving Parts Press was located here at 10699 Empire Grade, Bonnie Dune, California. We rented the house for 25 years. Next. Here's the house at six o'clock the evening of August 19, 2020. Next. Here is the site of my home and shop 12 hours later, the morning of August 20th. Next. The, the view from the driveway after the fire took the entire neighborhood. Our area just below Alba Road and to either side of Empire Grade was devastated. At least 20 homes plus outbuildings were destroyed. I'll just run through a few slides of the site taken in September and November. I have visited three times and have taken hundreds of photographs. It is very difficult, overwhelming to look at them even now, five months later. Next. Esteemed photographer Shmuel Thaler of the Santa Cruz Sentinel newspaper created a photo essay on my experience for the Thanksgiving issue of the paper. Two things I can be thankful for are our safety and the fact that in 2018, the Moving Parts Press Archive went to special collections at the UC Santa Barbara Library. So one of each of my print pieces through 2018 are tucked away safely there where people can visit and see the work. Fortunately, my books are also collected widely, including here at UC Santa Cruz. Many thanks for that. Next. Here's Sherwood's 1948 Victoria Platin Press. Losing his legacy is disturbing. I was merely the caretaker of these historic pieces for the duration of my lifetime. I feel very unsettled by my inability to do so. Next. It was possible to see how the building collapsed in place. This wasn't an explosion, but a very, very hot and fast house fire. This is what was left of the room where my most valuable books were carefully stored. You can see the stacks of books made up of ash. It's amazing how they held their shape. Next. The only evidence of thousands of pieces of metal type is a few rivulets of lead. Lead type melts at just over 600 degrees. With the average temperature of a house fire ranging from one to 2000 degrees, it is likely thousands of beautiful letters vaporized. Next. The current home of Moving Parts Press is the nine by 14 foot shed that my father used as his studio for 40 years. Next. In October, a crew of six moved a Vandercook proof press out of the calligrapher Judy Dietrich's root cellar just six miles away to my shed. I was fortunate to find a press locally and it's a beauty. The shed has been insulated and so far is pretty snug this winter, though the rain is still coming in around the south facing window, no matter how much caulking we do. Next. In November, I printed my first broadsides on the new press. The broadsides are dedicated to recovery from the fires last summer. I selected three poems by noted Santa Cruz poets, Ellen Bass, Danusha Lamaris, and Gary Young. Each poem addresses issues of loss and recovery in the face of crisis. Next. The broadsides are available for sale at Bookshop Santa Cruz. All proceeds from the sale of the broadsides will be donated to aid in the recovery of the community from the devastating wildfires in August. The URL for the uh, bookshop, it will also be in the chat. Next. I wouldn't have thought it possible, but due to the incredible generosity of our community, I've been able to pivot from scrambling for the very survival of the press to a dream of thriving in a new building. Plans for a new studio to replace the existing shed are before the Mendocino Historical Review Board. My, my dad submitted drawings for this building 40 years ago 
when he was just about my age and they were approved but never realized. To help raise moving parts from the ashes, please visit this GoFundMe page to donate to the rebuilding of the press in my new home. And that will also be available in the chat. Next. Rising from the ashes. I feel hopeful about the future of Moving Parts Press, thanks to my family of collaborators, friends, fellow letterpress, fanatics, artists, activists, bookmakers, writers, librarians, book lovers. Did I leave anyone out? Interested parties? Next. About the books. My artist books are the result of collaborations with artists and writers, several of whom are with us, an unprecedented Zoom moment. I'll share slides of the books that we worked on together. Next. In 2007, I was approached by Guillermo Gomez Pena and Gustavo Vazquez about making a book in response to their video project, Documentado Undocumented. Two others, Jennifer Gonzalez and Zachary James Watkins were invited into the collaboration and the five of us met over a seven year period to produce the performative artist's book, Doc on Doc, Documentado Undocumented, Ars Shamanica Performatica. Jennifer and Gustavo are here this evening, it's fantastic. Next. Doc on Doc addresses the political, geographic, social and psychological boundaries between the United States and Mexico. It is a mixed media production housed in a high tech aluminum case, which contains my print book with performative texts by Gomez Pena and critical commentary by art historian Jennifer Gonzalez, as well as sound art by Zachary Watkins and the videos that triggered the project by Gustavo Vasquez. Next. Doc on Doc is a traveling case for apprentice shamans, a reliquary for imaginary saints. Next a toolbox for self-transformation, a quiet call to heal yourself with fetishes and antidotes, a border kit to face the uncertainty of future crossings. Next. There were 65 of these books in the edition, of which 15 were housed in the electronic case. There are 15 spreads in the accordion fold book, which extends to over 31 feet. The aim is for the book to perform the text actual scripts for stage performance in the absence of the performance artist. Next. Excerpt from Explaining to a Nurse What I Do by Guillermo Gomez Pena. I am an artist who sells ideas, not objects, not images, not skills, a performance artist, which means I write letters with my own blood. I wrestle with historical ghosts and post-colonial demons. I research the possibilities of silence and darkness. Next. In 2007, City Lights Books and Moving Parts Press co-published a trade edition of Doc on Doc. It presents the entire project and includes reproductions of the 15 prints, the original performance scripts, and a USB drive with the video and sound art. So far, City Lights has co-published the trade editions of two Moving Parts Press books. First, Codes Espangliensis, and now Doc on Doc. I am very grateful for this amazing partnership, supported by Elaine Katzenberger, which has allowed my books to be experienced around the globe. Next. TJ Demos, a writer and environmental justice activist and longtime collaborator and binder, Craig Jensen, worked with me to make the necropolitics of extraction. TJ Demos is with us this evening. Looking forward to hearing from him. Next. In this accordion fold book, one long print comments on the rapacious aspects of global extraction and resolves in a call to action with TJ's essay. It is my contribution to the Codex Foundation's current project, Extraction, Art on the Edge of the Abyss. Complex causalities and effects of global extraction. Next. Capitalism's rapacious commodification of anything and everything. Next. Then movement building and solidarity with those on the front lines of opposition. Greta Thunberg, Emma Gonzalez, Malala, Robert Bullard, Berta Caceres, Tom B.K. Goldtooth, Wangari Matai. Next. And finally, 
to make the impossible gradually possible. There is no other choice. Next. I had just finished the necropolitics of extraction when the fire took everything. There are 10 copies remaining of an edition of 40. I had planned to hand color 10 copies, but only three remain. <clears throat> Next. Khalifas, The Ancestral Journey, El Viaje Ancestral, was co-published with Museo Eduardo Carrillo and is making its debut this month. It is part of Museo's Khalifas Legacy Project, celebrating Chicanx legacy artists and Latinx art in the Tri-County area, ringing the Monterey Bay. Next. The book was produced in a limited edition of one original copy, a 3D shadow box cover by Amalia Mesa, Mesa, Mesa Baines forms the cover, followed by paintings by Ralph de Oliveira, Carmen Leon, Guillermo Aranda, and Eduardo Carrillo, executed by Betsy Anderson. A small edition of full-size digital facsimiles was also created for the collaborators. Next. Amalia Mesa Bain's shadow box commemorates the role of her ancestors with male and female burial figures from Jalisco, Mexico. Amalia is here with us. I hope we can talk about this project as well as the new project we are working on together. Next. Ralph de Oliveira's painting of the Chumash Rainbow Bridge begins this collaborative movable mural. The rainbow ties Ralph and Carmen's panels together. Carmen Leon's panel celebrates the Peruvian and Mexican deities of her ancestors within the landscape of the Central Coast. And Guillermo Aranda reflects on his Az Aztec ancestors in his painting, drawing together four symbols that have guided his life. Next. We all collaborated very closely with Betsy Anderson, Museo Director on the Califas Book Project. Museo Eduardo Carrillo is a virtual museum only and will be co-hosting an online exhibit of the entire Califas Project beginning in March. This will be included in the Google Cultural Institute, a Google nonprofit initiative to make arts and culture accessible worldwide. Next. The Khalifa's Legacy Project includes documentary videos, exhibitions, community programming, and online resources. Nine organizations are participating in a series of events taking place between January and April 2021, right now. Our panel this evening is one of them. This is the exhibit cur currently virtual at the Monterey Museum of Art. Other books and broadsides from the Moving Parts Press Chicanx Latinx series are also showing here until April. Next. I also designed a commercially printed small scale edition of the book. 750 copies are being given to schools, libraries, museums, and other youth serving organizations throughout the Central Coast region. This trade edition of the book went into a second printing because 500 of the first 750 copies were destroyed in the August fire. The Santa Cruz City Arts Commission generously supported both printings. Next. In a collaboration with the Santa Cruz and Watsonville Public Libraries, and in response to the pandemic, displays of the book inside the libraries are augmented by banners facing the world. Support for this project has been amazing. Arts Council Santa Cruz County, California Arts Council, California Humanities, and Hit and Run Press also contributed. Next. Latinx, Chicanx Poetics, is a series of 15 broadsides by contemporary queer Latinx Chicanx poets and is co-edited with poetis, poets Angel Dominguez and Hannah Kazima. When we first met in 2015 as neighbors in Bonnie Dune, it quickly became clear that a cross-pollination would occur. I'm excited that they are both on the panel this evening and they'll have to tell us a little about their journey to get here. Next. Each broadside has been printed in an edition of 60, 30 for the author and 30 for a box set to be published in 2023. The first five broadsides intended for these sets were destroyed by the fire. The originals will be, not be included in the box sets, but digital reproductions will be added. Hope beyond the shape of a century, Angel Dominguez. Next. La Independencia de Puerto Rico. Raquel Salas Rivera, and first-generation decolonized bilinguista, Josiah Luis Alderete. Hannah Kazima was working with me in the shop, typesetting, printing, designing, acting as a wonderful soundboard when the pandemic hit a year ago. 
We stopped working together physically for some months, but then had some time in the shop, masked with plenty of ventilation until everything blew up. Next. Nunca Muero, Tatiana Lubovisky, Acosta, and Queer Paloma Families by Farid Matuk. I'm continuing this series in Mendocino and will be printing the next broadside in February. I miss having Hannah with me. Next. So here's the Moving Parts Press website and please visit for more on my projects and publications. I take um, keeping it current and uh, spreading the word about my work through the broadside very seriously. And thank you, I'm excited to be here. Thanks so much, Felicia. Okay, that was wonderful. I mean, the images are amazing and it's incredibly moving to see all the things that you've done. So I'd like to now ask everybody to join us. So Jennifer, Gustavo, TJ, Angel, Hannah, thank you, Amalia. And I thought that what we could do now is try to have a real gathering and a discussion. And so I won't give extended formal introductions of all of you amazing people. Uh, I'll let you instead introduce yourself. What I'll do is I'll try to cue so we can figure out how to do this without talking over each other and give you all a chance to talk. So Jennifer and Gustavo, if you wanna start us off. Thank you, Rachel, so much for this wonderful opportunity to celebrate to celebrate Felicia's amazing work. And I wanted to say just as a very beginning comment that Felicia is a master of her craft and her craft is not only making these incredible books, she is a master of collaboration. She has really found a sweet spot for connecting people together, for bringing people out in the kinds of projects that they're doing, for finding where their expertise lies and folding it into the project that she's interested in supporting. And that has been a real pleasure over the years. And I feel incredibly, um, really uh, very lucky to have been able to work with her, not just on the Doc Undock project, but also on the very first project that we did together, um, which was the Codex Expangliensis with Enrique Choya and Guillermo Gomez Pena. Because it started a kind of um, a connection that continued and continues in throughout our work together at the university and after. I remember feeling when I first met Felicia, why is she interested in this material? Why is she supporting this kind of pursuing these artist projects? And one of the things that I found inspiring working with Felicia is how committed she is to social justice and how for a long time Moving Parts Press has been um, supporter of poets, supporter of artists, supporter of people who are trying to offer a new vision of what's possible. And that's why I really have enjoyed collaborating with her. And also in this, the Doc Undoc project, I'm gonna stop really soon and let Gustavo talk about it. Um, we had a really fun time thinking about form and thinking about what does it mean to transform a person and how do you think about the transformations that take place when you cross borders or cross dress or cross pollinate. And we were trying to think about all of the different ways that um, this kind of crossing could take place in a material form. And the, the idea of constructing an altar, like a kind of triptych, making the book and the, the case of the, the, in which the book would be seen into a kind of triptych-like space that was at the same time a sort of theatrical mirror with all of the artifacts that one might find in a reliquary that one could then put on, making engaging with the book very um, material and uh, performative was one of the things we really wanted to see happening. So I'm sitting inside the, um, the box right now. <laughs> and if I duck down, you can see, you know, there's a figure, um, but this with all this kind of um, very camp, um, very um, playful, um, culturally uh, relevant type of materials that were in this box were really fun to talk about and design and laugh over and enjoy. So I just really want to say, Felicia, thank you so much for your inspiration and for including me in these projects, which have been really meaningful as well as joyful. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just say quickly that um, all those great meetings over seven years, I was taking notes and making sketches and, and um, for myself and 
posterity. And I had a whole box of wonderful stuff that I kind of held back from giving to the UC Santa Barbara. So it's, I was thinking, no, these, they, I need these near me. They, they come in handy and they are gone. And that's one of my great regrets. Well, I'm Gustavo and I had the pleasure to work with you, Felicia. And I was recalling the first time that I met you was at El Picaro, probably in 1997, 98, mm -hmm. with, I think it was Enrique Chagoya that you mm -hmm. met. And that mm -hmm. was the first time I met you. So like almost 15 years later, we uh, get to collaborate mm -hmm. in this wonderful, magical, fantastic collaboration with Sacri, sound artists with Guillermo, with Jennifer's great um, knowledge of how our work related to the, the tradition of the cabinets of curiosities and how the work evolved thanks to you because you took the role of the producer. I mean, me and Guillermo will be making this video performative poetic pieces and then we decided, well, it would be great to work with Felicia. And we just thought of as far as a book, but then the book turned into a, an object for people to perform, to interact with that object. And I think that in some ways, subconsciously, we were um, considering that the materiality was important to touch to interact with something physical, especially in this day of digital world that everything is like right now, there's nothing to hold on to. Mm -hmm. Everything is in, in, the, in um, mathematical numbers floating in this universe. And I think one of the exciting things about working with you is because you have the energy of a 17 year old young artist. And we had great parties with you, great brainstorming sessions. Mm -hmm was a lot of fun mm -hmm. doing the work, but you have the vision and the tenacity to last and make projects that are like a huge film project. It's like, it takes years to make the kind of delicate, precise work. I remember going over and over with you, meeting with you about the sketches, about the drawings, because Guillermo and myself uh, asked you, instead of just um, doing that, part of a great producer and um, an incredible printer, maestra printer, printmakers, to, we asked you if you could draw, if you were interested in drawing. And you say, yes, I would love to. And you got really excited. Yeah. And that kind of enthusiasm is like part of the magic of, that makes our work worth doing. Mm -hmm. The surprise elements, as things evolve, nobody had the full vision, but you had the tenacity and you took over. You just did the driving force to make all this coordination, because Guillermo's always traveling all over the world, performing and all that, to keep the vision going and the momentum going. And I, thanks to you, we were able to materialize this uh, a project that started from a little seed into a huge, um, incredible um, piece that I think many people are uh, enjoying because it's very provocative, it's sweet, it's scary, it's, uh, it's mysterious. Uh, I mean, we even struggle trying to figure out what is it? Is one of the questions, is this mysterious questions in, in terms of the kind of experience we're creating for the interactive public. Yeah, I was so, uh, uh, you bring up a lot of things. One thing for me was one evening, I remember calling you and saying, I just need to bounce these prints off some, but on, off of, of Guillermo and he's traveling and I can't, and you, and he, you said, I'm coming right over. It was practically like that. You, and we had this huge conference room and I spread out all the prints and you gave me feedback and I was able to go on. I, you know, it's like initiating the project came from you and Guillermo and then each of you 
fed me along the way ideas and things. And, you know, if you propose something, I was going to, you know, chomp, grab it. Like I say, I practice the rat terrier form of collaboration, <laughs> you, know, uh, uh, you know, until we get it. And uh, we, uh, we really made it through uh, uh, seven years from beginning to end. That was something that was really something. So behind me is one of the pages of the of the book, and uh, it has. We were in those meetings. We were talking about how we had to have that rough edge of the border culture, of the border reality, of the popular culture, but uh, tough, tough. And uh, you went for it. And yeah, I love the the results. Yeah, yeah. You went into um, Guillermo's uh, home, and his whole house is his altar, and you took a hundred photographs of all the objects and then I used them as the basis for the drawing. So a little tiny chihuahuas became a big drawing and um, it, it just worked so well, it worked so well. Well, I just wanna say thank you for being such a wonderful collaborator and your incredible energy. I mean, you really have this incredible drive that is uh, admirable and inspiring. Thank you, thank you. I think that one of the things that it made me think of too is that you're materializing collaboration so that the object actually, you know, I love how Jennifer, you described that, that what you're seeing is the joy and then that like the deep ideas and the struggling with to material and you're materializing actually the relationships and the collaboration. So I think that's really lovely. And I look forward to hearing a lot more about, uh, about collaboration and how it fits into your practice. Cause I think that's clearly um, so central. So TJ, do you want to talk a little bit about your project with Lisha? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and I'd like to just add on to what everyone else is saying uh, in terms of just an expression of gratitude um, to Felicia for all the creative work that she's been doing. And uh, that goes for me in terms of uh, our collaboration. Uh, Felicia got in touch a couple years ago and uh, expressed an interest to transform one of my essays or a, a, a part of a, um, uh, an excerpt from one of my writings into a, um, an artist book. And I felt really honored by uh, that invitation and really happily uh, collaborated with her on it. Um, and she chose an essay that, um, that dealt with the politics of extraction. And this, this is quite a difficult uh, and political uh, phenomenon. Uh, and, it, and I've been asked to speak today very briefly about necropolitics and fire. This, this is really maybe too complex and challenging to speak about in five minutes, but let me try to connect some of the dots, uh, including um, how extraction might relate to, the, to, to fires and ultimately um, drawing a, a conclusion to the production of this book. Uh, Felicia's artist book. So extraction, I, in my essay, I'm trying to explore how extraction is not just a matter of primary forms of mining and fossil capital, energy systems and rare earth uh, extractivism, but also increasingly deals with things like labor and information, social media extraction, surveillance capitalism, as well as museums and universities. Increasingly, we live, we live in a world where um, nothing is free and everything is, is subjected to forms of uh, um, the production of, of profit, uh, where even you know, universities and, and art galleries are increasingly dedicated to um, attempting to at least um, extract wealth from, from people. So extraction has to do with the fundamental logic of capitalism. And that's something my essay was attempting to uh, address in, in short form which Felicia transformed into this um, amazing artwork. So um, this was all interrupted by the fires. And, and, and in fact, I've been really interested in um, dealing with the imagery and the aesthetics of fires in some of my work. And I think there's some important lessons to be learned in connecting some of these areas, uh, which I'd like to focus on. One, one is that, and, I, and I've written about elsewhere, one is that um, we're, you know, in California, there's the company PG&E, which is a significant energy system within our region. And this is an investor-owned for-profit corporation, which has admitted culpability for 
uh, for their causing fires in the past, like the um, the Camp Fire, which was the most destructive in California history in 2020. Um, they didn't seem to have any responsibility for the CZU complex fire that burned down moving parts press. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a larger system at work here, which we, I think, need to be aware of and pay attention to. Um, PG&E is, uh, like I said, investor owned. Its CEO earns between six and eight million a year in salary and, and stocks. And if, you, if we look at closely at this company, what we find is that they're increasingly drawing out value from consumers. And instead of redirecting that toward repairing their lines for the safety of everyone, uh, they're basically profiting off of the disaster that they've been causing in recent years. And this will likely continue in, into the future. So this is something I'm, I think is really important to think about. Uh, in terms of supporting structural transformation in how our utility companies uh, are organized. And that includes wow. projects like Let's Own PG&E, which proposes ways to municipalize or transform this private company into a worker-owned uh, uh, company uh, for greater accountability and um, ethical relationality and support and welfare and safety for everyone. So this is something that pertains to my work and my writing. And really it, it ultimately gets at the question of, uh, which is fundamental for me, how can we live in a way that is non-extractive, right? Um, so my essay that is featured in Felicia's book is, is uh, describing these conditions and ultimately getting to the point where uh, what we need to do is support non-extractive forms of life. Um, and that ultimately has to do with building movements uh, through solidarity so that we can actually transform the world from a system that is generally geared toward prioritizing profits uh, uh, before people uh, to one that is based on ethical relationalities. So I think what Felicia is bringing to all this in, in terms of her transformative aesthetics that uh, she, you know, she, um, directed toward uh, my essay and expressed it in, in this uh, really interesting artist book uh, format is that this itself is a form of um, small scale, independent, local arts based creativity. Uh, in other words, that itself is a, is a, a matter of resistance toward the larger conditions uh, that yes, the art world and the universe system, educational systems are increasingly dedicated to, which is basically extractive enterprises that's a fundamental logic of capitalism. So I think um, uh, this is the kind of activity that I'm really invested in supporting. I'm grateful for that collaboration with Felicia to try to develop this kind of uh, different paradigm of ethical relationality that for me is part of a just transition to what I try to um, describe in, in this short essay. Uh, which is a just transition to a decolonial and ultimate, ultimately post-capitalist future. So um, that's a lot of you know, quite radical rhetoric, but um, it really comes down to the nuts and bolts of how we do that in everyday life. And uh, Felicia's activity is really uh, amazing. And again, I'm thankful and honored for, uh, for her uh, efforts at um, working with my own um, proposals and, and conceptualizations and transforming them into a book that again features, uh, this, is, this is one, I'll, I'll just end with one thing that Felicia brought to the essay, which is um, featuring a, a range of different climate justice environmentalists um, uh, from Robert Bullard to Berta Caceres, who was unfortunately murdered in Honduras, uh, supporting uh, community and environmentalist rights. Um, Tom Goldtooth, an important indigenous uh, um, environmentalist, Wangari Matai, who was, is based, was, was based in Kenya and participated in the, the uh, movement building around growing uh, reforestation in, uh, in East Africa. So a range of really important figures and it's exactly that kind of solidarity and um, again, ethical relationality that I think is, is uh, um, that comes out of this process for me. So thanks again. And yeah, that's all I have to say. Well, I want to say in response that I wanted to point out that my approach to our collaboration was new to me, um, and I'm building on it with another project now to take the uh, 
previously published essay of yours. I've read a lot of your stuff and um, pull out the phrases that uh, struck me as um, the basis for prints in a, in a book and, and devise sort of a narrative through the book, through the long print. And uh, in the end, once I was done with my print, TJ came back in and wrote the essay in response to my print. So that's a new form of collaboration for me. I guess it's not that much different than being an editor. You say, yeah, this is good. No, take that out. We don't want that. We want this. And in a way it's the same thing, but there's vision of, of image making and a coherent book and then a, a writing in response to that that's published within the context of working with a poet now where I'm taking the same approach and she's given me everything she's ever published and I'm looking for the stuff that really speaks to me. The subtitle of that book is Justice and Injustices. And then um, when I'm done, she'll come back in and write a poem which will be published in the book. So that feels like a wonderful exchange back and forth round, coming round full circle. So thanks for that opportunity to try that idea out with you extracting phrases from, for the necropolitics of extraction. Yeah, and thank you, Felicia. And extractive methodology though, the extracting phrases without extraction. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And I love this. I like, again, like I knew that the idea of collaborations and I think relationality that we keep coming up with it, that there's a model here that we're about thinking together, working together, um, that is that you manage to scale in a way that is workable, but then can reach such broad audiences. I mean, seeing even what's happening right now with the images on the libraries and all of this, that you take these relationships and these things that are very intimate and then allow all these people access to them, which I think is really magical. Um, I wanna say to everybody who is not on the screen right now, but is with us, make sure if you have comments or you have questions, you add them into the Q&A and we will add them to the discussion. I'll keep up with them. And thank you, Elaine, for pointing out the link to the trade edition for Doc and Doc, because that's super cool. I'm glad you're here. Um, oh, yeah. I, I wanted to make sure that was clear. And I would say and in response to the, uh, Gustavo's and um, Jennifer's comments, just that uh, the Doc and Doc trade edition is a guide to that very complex project. It, it, take, it has every element and it walks you right into, the, into it. And it really, um, they are a pair. It, it, they complement each other, having the original and the together. Um, it's not just a transcription, they, they work together. Great, thank you. Amalia, do you wanna chime in? Yes, um, <clears throat> I've been thinking and listening um, as this sort of narrative of Felicia's work has unfolded, there's sort of echoes that keep resounding. And I'm talking about the Khalifa's project, but some of the terminology that people have used, like words like solidarity and justice and um, this kind of cross-cultural uh, work ethic that Felicia uses is so much a part of <clears throat> how Khalifa's came about. Of course, Khalifa's was sponsored by Museo Eduardo Carillo uh, as an outgrowth of Eduardo's very well-known uh, conference in 1982 called Califas that was done at UC Santa Cruz. I was young then and um, sometimes I look back and I go, what bad hair I had, what was wrong with me? <laughs> but it's fun to watch it in terms of the video and Guillermo was part of the video. But as the years has unfolded, we've come to realize that Califas has had a longer impact than we imagined. And so this is the latest iteration of it. And it resides here in the Central Coast. And I believe that Museo in collaboration with Betsy, and then of course, once Felicia came into it, it allowed us to try to focus on visibility issues for artists in the Central Coast. You know, for many Chicanx artists or Chicano artists, as we were called early on, um, if we were near a center like Galeria de la Raza or Self-Help Graphics or the Mexican Museum or any of them, Social Public Art Resource Center, we had a vehicle by which we could become uh, more active as artists and be visible. The Central Coast didn't really have that. There were smaller 
uh, the Tortuga Patrol. There were smaller groups, but I think it's been a long time coming, the recognition of those artists, many of whom are mu muralists. So when Felicia and Betsy asked me to join the project, I thought, well, how can I fit in when I'm not a muralist and the work that I do has been large scale installations, some smaller uh, works, uh, large shadow box pieces, and then of course, prints. So I think of Felicia as sort of like the conductor now. And, and she's very symphonic in that way. She brings all the parts together and she conducts them. And she moved us through a, a really a very diverse project. You had, you know, four artists that you had to find a way to connect to each other. She has a kind of fluidity. I mean, it's a given and we've all talked about it. The mastery of her skills in visualizing uh, and, and her incredible, incredible power of text. Uh, selecting the right typeface, the right words. And so I feel like in Khalifas, she helped me to become part of a larger project that most likely I would not have been involved in. So my shadow box cover was an outgrowth of some of my other work that she had seen and she resolved the way that I might be able to participate. The folding book is just a miracle, it's quite beautiful. And her way of knitting together each of the pages is really masterful. And I think that um, the linking of writers and image makers is a power that those terms, solidarity, justice, ethics, they're really the character of Felicia's work. And so it's not a question of how we find her or how she finds us. It's that we do work that converges and she is there to help us make that convergence successful. And you know, all power to Betsy because she has been able to, along with Felicia and others, move the project in a very difficult time during the pandemic when we can't really have the exhibits we plan to do, uh, move the piece across these very disparate venues and into the libraries. And for all of us who worked on Khalifas and who've been involved in Museo, one of the driving forces has always been the access to education for primarily Latino and Latinx students, but to others as well. And I really think that there would be no Khalifas without Felicia's capacities. And I really do mean that. The vision and the experience, the way in which she tackled it in some ways a kind of, it's an essential quality of Khalifas, which is spirituality. But not a lot of people know how to deal with it in the contemporary art world or in the contemporary world period. And she somehow sensed that the story that was unfolding, the snake, the rainbow, the indigenous, the ancestral, the ancient, that all of those elements were an unfolding spirituality that linked us as Chicanx artists back to ancient times and forward into the contemporary. And, and without Felicia, I don't think we would have done that. So for me, um, that, that's really the great part of doing this project. And so I've been inspired. And so Felicia and I are starting on a new project. I've been doing a series of what Jennifer has named auto topographies. Um, and they're kind of visual autobiographies called Venus Envy. And this series began in the 90s, 93, I think. It's still ongoing and um, fingers crossed it might be in a big traveling show coming up in 2023. So we're, we're still waiting on that. But I am working with Felicia on the beginnings of a, a book that would carry out in a certain sense the manifestation of the chapters themselves. Um, there are four chapters. So that's something I'm looking forward to. And it's a uh, it's kind of looking back and looking forward because I've been doing that particular work for such a long time. And I would trust no one, no one, but Felicia to do that with me. And, and Jennifer has been part of that process of mine. And I'm, I'm just really grateful to be here, grateful to Felicia. And I think there's something so wonderful in what we're talking about today, which is that as artists and writers and thinkers, we find ways even in the worst situations and we have been in the worst situation to make sense out of all of that, to give beauty and meaning to others and to extend our own sense of hope and inspiration. So I'm grateful to Felicia for all of that. Thanks. 
I just want to say that the um, the medium for me, both in physical and spiritual and um, conceptual form, is the book. And it's the book going back to its very beginnings and its relevance today. So when I think of its very beginnings, we can go back to any kind of sequential presentation of information and writing, different forms of writing over centuries, uh, thousands of years, and then the um, form finally in the 15th century into the codex as we know it, the Western codex as we know it, and the form of the creation of movable type. And, it, and, it, and when I think back to those early days, what we know of the craftsmen in Western Europe, the businessmen, the publishers, everything they did in the first 50 years, once they had these new technology, paper, inks, presses, type, you know, all once it all came together, it converged. Um, people who were interested could afford to buy, you know, all of it coming together. Um, every possibility, every manifestation of the book happened in the first 50 to 150 years. They call it the incunabula period, period the mm. swaddling clothes of the book. And even down to selling, you know, indulgences, prayers that if you bought this prayer from the Catholic Church, then you were absolved of your sin. And um, so it was monetized and commercialized. And I just uh, take that envelope and take all of what people have to offer into that envelope and start stirring. And um, there are different roles that we can play in that. And each person in the collaboration takes an, is, a, is another role. And I feel really grounded in the, in the history, in, the, in my forebears, in the legacy of the book. I have to say, Felicia, that was exactly the question I was going to ask you. So I was thinking about this, you know, I keep thinking between the collaborations and the kind of relations that you're making, linking image and text, this cross-cultural, this like vital <laughs> cross-cultural linkages you make, the past to the present, the spirituality, that it's always centered around the book, that it, you're, you know, placing the book itself as the link. So, you know, I think that you just, that's, you know, as you said, I so, said, you know, you went right there because I'm like, there's something about this form. Do you want to say a little bit more about how you use it as a linkage? Well, the book, but even more specific, the book uh, suggests a structure and, and not just the Western because I'm using this accordion thing and, but um, the word. So it's the language. It's our language. It's languages. You know, it's um, starting with the written word. That's what um, I spring off of. That's where I go for resonance. That's why poetry, you know, the, the um, emphasis on each word. Um, on the other hand, in the Doc on Doc, we went on to use intermedia, multimedia, video, and sound, and um, light. You know, I remember when we were making that case, uh, the Peter Elsie was building the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the electronics to run the case. And he said, they were, we were gonna have lit, suddenly we were having illuminated buttons that would trigger the sound. And then he said, do you want the buttons to chase? Do you want the lights to chase? And I was like, what is chase? I have no idea. And of course, it's a term for lighting design. And suddenly I was a lighting designer, you know. So, okay, now I'm a lighting. I love being stretched in that way. I love being stretched in that way. And I love the way Doc and Doc pulled me that direction. And then with the next book, Border Bus with Juan Felipe Herrera, we had a USB drive based on that experience with the USB drive and the trade edition. We spent a whole afternoon with people who were not. Um, actors or poets um, uh, reading, well, one was a poet, 
but reading this long poem in the two voices of two women detained on an ice bus in Spanish and English and recording after recording after record, iteration after iteration till we had the one that's now in the trade edition of art that's in both all it, that uh, travels with the book. So um, starting with the word and then just like, whoosh, where can it go? Can it go here? Can it go there? What can it do? Can it go up? Can it go down? And I'm just like, my mom was a nut. My mom was an amazing person and an artist. And um, every time she had a recipe that she liked, like um, fruit breads, you know, zucchini bread, she would start experimenting. She was an alchemist. So it would be, hey, you want to try this tomato bread? Oh, I made this artichoke bread. You want to try this bread? She would just explore every iteration of the bread. And then when it came to her mushrooms and exploring mushroom dyes, it was the same thing. Can I get all the colors out of these mushrooms? And she did. You know, she she um, is the doyen of mushroom dye uh, in the world. So that's a model. You know, just don't quit. Just keep going. Angel and Hannah, do you want to join in? Yes, thank you so much, Felicia, and for everybody who put this together. Um, it's really lovely to hear from all of Felicia's collaborators. I feel a strange kinship and familiarity, especially with what everyone is saying. I couldn't agree more. And I love, Felicia, how you how you speak about your mother as an alchemist, because I think of you as an alchemist. <laughs> um, and so we're both writers and artists. Um, and we met in grad school in Colorado, and then we moved out to Santa Cruz in 2015. And just looking for some kind of poetry community or semblance of such, I completely on a limb was just Googling, you know, like, where are the poets? Where are the, <laughs> are there any small presses? Are there any, you know, people working with text and image? And lo and behold, I came across Felicia and Moving Parts Press, literally five minutes up the road from where we live. And it just seemed so strange and serendipitous that I just emailed her and I was just, you know, hi, like me and my partner are fresh out of grad school looking for community. Um, you know, there's a little bit about me and, and I'd love to learn more about you. Your books are beautiful. I, I couldn't get over the collaborations I had seen, you know, with Juan Felipe Herrera and here. Guillermo Gomez Pena, and I was just like, oh my goodness, who is this woman? Um, and she got right back to me. And, and I think we met maybe that same weekend or shortly thereafter, she just invited me into her home. <laughs> um, I was completely blown away by this press, which if you'll see the background, this is a snapshot from... Oh from moving parts from press. this was moving parts press um yeah this was on a day where uh i actually came over and i got um several action shots of felicia working um during the pandemic on the, mask on. on the latinx uh who, yeah with masks we were very safe yes. the whole time um and i also just want to say it is a tremendous um, energy to be constellated in this way. I feel so much like I know all of you collaborators. I feel like I've walked back into Felicia's office, which was right next to the press um, area. And I, ca I can feel the dock and dock mm. boxes there. I can feel that energy. I can, you know, I, I'm just recalling moments of uh, coming over for dinner and uh, Felicia was working on the collaboration with TJ Demos mm -hmm. um, and just seeing these things. And you know, and I think that's just so, um, I wanna just echo everyone in that Felicia very much is a master of collaboration and always welcoming this collaborating. Um, and Gustavo, I completely agree. Like her energy is unstoppable, that of a 17 year old, like it's incredible. I, I just 
remember like always coming over and always it was a, a new project um, that was on the horizon. Um, and it's just been so very special to, um, to get to know you, Felicia, and, and to be friends and to be collaborators in this way. Um, and I do also just want to like very quickly say that in particular, I have always, uh, I have always been in awe of your commitment to not only community, but kinship, and especially to Latinx and Chicanx uh, writers and artists. And it is so rare to encounter a collaborator who handles the collaboration with such sincerity um, and just and just truly on like, you know, as, as was mentioned on like a spiritual level, um, like very much attending to the spirit of all things. And yeah, I just, it very important. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's beautiful actually, because out of that fast friendship, well, not immediately, but um, in 2019, uh, Felicia gave me the great honor of um, letting me be her shop assistant and working with her with the type, um, which slowly evolved into what would be the Latinx Chicanx Poetics Broadside series, um, which I can't even, I'm gonna try to be very concise about it, but um, it was so meaningful. I mean, not only to be in, in that space, working with the inky type and, and the manual labor of the, <laughs> of the roller after you get the paint on and, and, and cleaning the rollers and um, tying up the type and all of these things that I had only sort of gotten an introduction on in the past, I felt like I was really immersed into her process um, in a really beautiful way. And so I thought, if it's all right, I would quickly read the wall text about the series that is presently happening at the Monterey Museum of Art. Um, this series began in 2019 as a continuation of Moving Parts Press's Chicanx Latinx series of artist books produced by Felicia Rice. Inspired by the accessibility of the broadside form as text object, this project is a collaboration between artists, poets, editors, activists, and translators of the LGBTQIA plus Latinx and Chicanx communities. In the selection of poets, we wanted to honor the complex and ever-evolving multitudes held within the identities of Latinidad. This broadside series acts as a kind of soil sample, offering a glimpse at the living landscape of Latinx writers continuing to create despite the trying times we find ourselves in. They are sacred transmissions of energy meant to help their readers in the face of apocalypse and uncertainty. This series continues despite a global pandemic, a violent political administration, and the ongoing effects of climate change. The series came to a halt following the CZU Lightning Complex fires of August 2020, which destroyed the broadsides intended for box sets, along with Rice's personal archives of her life's work. Moving Parts Press continues to rise from the ashes, envisioning another future for these broadsides. As Rice wrote, this situation is unprecedented and throws everything into question. But one thing I feel I have to offer is the hope of continuation. Bad or good, I slash we will be here doing what I, we do day after day for the immediate future. And during this time, I, we have the choice to make the absolute best of it. I don't use the word make lightly. Making is what I do as a maker, as an artist, and it keeps me stable and sane. So thank you, Felicia. Thank you, Felicia. The ultimate maker. Felicia wrote that to us amidst the pandemic, um, just before the CZU lightning complex mm -hmm. fires. So it, it really, it helped us to carry on and keep going. Yeah. We love you, Felicia. I'm just so thrilled to be working with um, people who uh, represent the, uh, another generation. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I love 
uh, being introduced to 15 poets like that I would never meet all over the country, all, you know, Puerto Rico to Puerto Arizona, to the Bay Area, to, you know, um, I don't know where Gabe is and I'm doing his Chicago. Chicago. So, um, and I'm just sort of getting to know them a little bit by reaching out and talking to them. And um, I had a great phone conversation with Josiah a couple days ago, a really long one. <laughs> we, we had a really good talk. So, uh, yeah, I am, um, I love, I love people. I love, I lo I'm, I'm very social. I work alone, you know, and I struggle alone in my press with my own stuff in there. And uh, at the same time, it's the communication with the world, with the individuals who I'm working closely with and the, and the broader audience that's out there. I was absolutely floored that 700 people emerged um, really without a friend, a colleague said, I will run this GoFundMe page for you. I couldn't have done it. I will write the introduction. I couldn't have done it. And it started and the thing took off and I had no idea. I had no idea that that many people would step up all, almost unsolicited, right? And um, so I, you know, now I feel like, okay, <laughs> we gotta, we gotta do this thing. You know, there's no question about it. I mean, at one point when you have a fire like that, you, I felt uh, maybe it all stops here. You know, I used to say over the years, I will never stop doing this work until I'm burned out. <gasps> then I was, you know, <laughs> then I was, it's like, oh, I guess, hmm, I'm gonna stop doing the work. Well, I could pick up a paintbrush. I could retreat into myself. I could, and then the friend calls and says, "I can run this GoFundMe page." And I say, "Okay." And then the work feedback starts coming in. It's like, "Don't stop! Don't stop! Don't stop!" And so I'm like, mm -hmm. "Okay, I'm going to keep doing this. I got another 20 years on the outside, so uh, we'll see what comes of that. New projects, the Chicanx, uh, Latinx." Uh, poetic series and um, we'll see where that goes because by giving 30 copies to each poet who who is reading who does have an active working poets with active life um, those it's only 30 but I don't know you know maybe 15 become a book maybe 15 become a website um, become an animation become a part of a film I mean it's it's something. It's something. You know, there's been a few questions in the Q&A function. And I think that they're, um, the, one of the questions I think would be interesting to hear from a lot of you, right? Because there's a question from Art Patino that really asks about the move onto the, right now into the virtual remote ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. How are we continuing to think? And they're talking, they're a student in international relations in conflict resolution in a master's program thinking about their passion for arts and humanities, they're being a transplant, a migrant student from agriculture and labor movements, caring about issues, but caring about it through the arts. And I was wondering if you wanna talk, not just Felicia, but everybody thinking about this moment in which this is how we're talking to each other, that Felicia's model of relationality, right, continues even when we're online. So how are we approaching the digital, the digital world in this? Gustavo, can I ask you? put you on the spot? Sure, you can put me on the spot. <clears throat> well, I think that what happens in, um, uh, in these times is to, everyone's seen a, a beautiful um, poetic um, video by three Italian creators. And it's a, it's a letter, may, maybe many of you have seen it. It's, it's a letter to the world, to humanity from the virus. And one of the things that uh, stayed with me is is that there's a beautiful idea that says, eh, I'm not your enemy, the virus is talking to us. I'm, I'm your, I'm your um, reminder. I'm just here to, I'm a messenger. That's what it is. I'm a messenger. And I think that this, these are moments of introspection. This is moments to slow down all the madness, to be busy and, and stressed out. 
And I know that there's a lot of demands. Not everybody has the same privilege and opportunity to be working via Zoom. There's a lot of workers that need are in the fields, they're feeding all of us. So I don't I don't want to forget that important perspective of where my families are doing, my relatives. So I think at the same time, there is opportunity to they be, be less distracted. It's an opportunity to uh, that is related to our spirituality, our reflection, our relationship with nature, our relationship with others. The importance of not getting alienated, isolated. It's important to create, continue with our real friendships, uh, our, our relatives, checking in with everybody. So in many ways, I think it's an opportunity to reconnect to who we are as people. Uh, and, and I think that our role as artists is really an, an opportunity because uh, to, like in this session right now, I mean, there's um, what, 68 participants, okay? And, uh, and there's this opportunity to exchange notes. And you were talking about collaboration and it is possible to collaborate with these, um, fortunately with these digital technologies across continents. And then we're, you know, there's the positive and the negative to, with everything, right? Some people are planning to destroy and are, are we're planning to construct and to build and to have a, a, a new vision and direction that we're forced to. There's no choices anymore. So I'm collaborating presently with people in Oaxaca and having projects in, in, in a documentary on native corn. And that's important to me, how we can preserve native seeds uh, uh, on this planet before they disappear. And they will not disappear because there are communities that are committed to that. And those are incredible movements that are quite inspiring, rooted in pre-Columbian, pre-contact uh, pre, um, with your, your pre-European contact with those indigenous communities that continue to have their systems of organization. So there's a lot, a lot of good things happening that maybe through this medium, we can access each other because the mainstream media is not, they don't care about these possibilities. Yeah. So there's good with it, I think. Did anyone else have anything to add? Amalia, you're off mute, if you have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off of mute. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's, it's an odd thing to say. I'm trying to say this, being sensitive in the way that Gustavo is about so many people in our community who don't have access to what we have access to. But for those of you who don't know, I um, was ill for many years with a heart condition and I got a new heart valve this last uh, March. And so um, uh, all those years, as my condition worsened, I could not travel. And so I missed many, many things that I wanted to go to and people would invite me to projects, keynotes, all kinds of things because I could not be there in person. And uh, I never considered myself disabled, but I took care of my sister for 20 years who was disabled. And I knew what it was like for people who don't have access, who are homebound. And um, she and I kept each other company. Um, and so I was thinking about it today that ironically, the pandemic, which forced everyone to stay home, like I always stayed home, um, became an opportunity for me. So I have traveled more and participated more in the pandemic than I have for the last 10 years. I'm so popular on Zoom. It makes me laugh, you know, that all those years I could not go anywhere and I had to say no. And if you say no long enough, they stop asking you. And now I am like everyone and everyone is like me at home. And uh, lucky for me, my husband, Richard Bames, he, he's the big technology guru. So he got me one of those ring lights and we set up a whole little studio for me uh, to project from. And I did television for many years before I moved to this region. When I lived in San Francisco, I worked for CBS. And uh, so I feel like I'm back on television again. And every week I get ready and I have a little makeup room and I have different headbands. And um, ironically, I just think it's so funny. I, I happen to really love Zoom. Sometimes I get tired of it, but the opportunity to be 
with Jennifer, with Gustavo, with young people like Hannah and Angel that I don't know. And TJ, I was totally transfixed by your commentary and extraction. I'm gonna go find all your books. But so I'm saying that this, this strange isolation becomes at the same time a kind of plurality where I'm learning things and watching things and uh, I'm like a regular even bright. That's the one that does all the, you know, events. And I follow different um, horticulturists and writers and people that I think I never would have done any of that if I'd been out or if I'd been able to do the things that I was restricted from for so long, other than of course writing and making my art. So I have to say that I think there is something about the openness of being closed up that I have found very important and I'm hopeful that it won't be lost. I think we have to work harder at making uh, digital access more available and we have to find ways to build more educational curriculum based models that can help distance learners. I mean, I, I did some of that work many years ago when I was at Far West Lab. So I know that uh, learning is on the virtual is a bit of an abstraction. It's why it doesn't work for very young children. Cognitively, they're not developed enough in that direction to really enjoy sitting in front of a screen. But for the rest of us, I think there are some attributes to the digital encounter, the virtual world that are not so bad. And I hope that our interconnectedness on the virtual won't be lost when we, um, I, actually, I don't think we're ever going back in the same way, I don't. I, I think this panic pandemic might be followed by another and even with the vaccine, we'll have to wear masks. And so the world will never be quite like it was, but I, I do think there are uh, possibilities in this that uh, can be expanded. And, and I don't mind it so much. It's Felicia, it's everybody's taking your model, the making relations and collaboration and treating this as opportunities, right? Well, it's a good one. Mm -hmm. It's a good model. Um, I wondered what Jennifer might have to say or uh, about the, the digital. Oh, it's really interesting to hear from Gustavo and Amalia because uh, they uh, said things that are inspiring and I agree with them and thinking about this question of possible connection and interconnection across long distances where, um, where travel isn't a barrier for a conversation. And it actually wasn't one previously, but it's a change of habit really that we're experiencing. And it's a change of thinking about intimacy and the habits of face-to-face mm. -face encounter and the habits of intimacy. And I think one of the other really wonderful elements of this condition is uh, being able to think creatively across digital platforms. So Zoom is currently the, the let's call it the, um, yeah, the ground zero of communications right now, at least through university settings for this kind of conversation. But it's not the only platform and it's not the only way we can do creative work. And I'm actually really interested in and pleased by and amazed by artists using this platform to do things like trying to do synchronous music performance, even mm -hmm. though it's incredibly challenging and trying to find the technology to make that happen. Um, artists who are using um, all kinds of interesting green screen effects and producing really playful theater theatrical performances. So it's not only communicating face-to-face uh, -face or having this sort of um, at-home intimacy with each other as a form of public panel, but also uh, treating the medium like a medium and beginning to think about the possibilities of the medium itself and where it might take okay. us next. So for me, that's another kind of exciting part to think about in terms of um, next steps in the digital. And I'm interested in what kind of books you might produce. What mm -hmm. kind of books might we produce where part of the book is actually on the screen and is a kind of mobile device? Um, what about augmented reality? How do we begin to think about those questions in relationship to print culture? Um, you know, how, how, we, how might we experience um, a walk uh, differently with augmented reality and text? And um, how might we collapse time frames from say 19th century text to 20th century forests? You know, how do we think about these really exciting possibilities? Um, and also how do we think about radical political culture? So we know that 
radical political culture relies upon, but also innovates with technology. And so how do we think about, um, for example, uh, live videos of extraction processes and, and, and the kind of immediate return of, of potential forms of protest? You know, how do we, how do we think about navigating those terrains in this new ish platform? So I think there's a lot of possibility there. One of the things with Doc on Doc, which kept kind of going, you know, there was a book and there was the case and then there was uh, more and the video go and things go there and more possibilities. And the one that came up, because my son pointed out to me, if you want your message to be heard in a widely popular way, it would be a game. So that was like, wow. Yes. We have everything to make a game, you know, an interactive, it was already an interactive experience, but a, a one that not a physical book, but actually something that you could move back and forth, a game. And it, and it seemed like we had the resources on campus to sort of make something like that happen. And then what happened for me was I had to pull back in and go, but where can I be more successful. I mean, what do I what do I have to offer? What do I have to offer? I would love for someone to create a game with the permission of everyone involved, but um, and maybe I could take a role of art direction and and everyone could get involved in some way. But I I have this thing with the book. I have this thing with paper and ink and image making and. I somehow feel like that's really my unique contribution. That is my contribution. And um, send me some of those great digital art and new media, you know, graduate students to take my books into game form or something. Perfect. I would love that. But I'm not going to become the game maker. So I need a collaborator for extending into new technologies. But also the type and the texture and the paper is what is the joy of your work. So I don't, I don't think um, it should ever stop being central and a component of the projects, all the projects. That's what we also, all of us love about the work, the tactility, the presence. Um, I don't think any of us want to replace that. I think that's the other thing we learned from this whole experience is that even we managed to do this, we actually prefer something else. So I think some exactly. of us, I think, yes. so I, think <laughs> I think that's another really helpful lesson mm -hmm. that, um, that we learn. Yeah, and I think that one of the things is not, we don't have to give up, right? We don't, this is, you know, we don't have to lose everything. We get to keep the book, right? We can, have, yes. can insist upon it and the tactility of the encounter and the material thing. Because and then it passes out of being a daily, uh, you know, the phone book, the, the da, 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 you know, a utilitarian object, mm -hmm. and is replaced it, replaced by um, less extractive uh, media, perhaps uh, electronic media. Um, then the book form is free to to do all kinds of other things. It doesn't. Uh, it's not required to deliver information in a certain way over and over and over and over. It can really grow and expand. And um, that's where I live. And I think there's been a couple of questions, TJ, too, that would help, I think, that you could help us think about. Because one of them is about craft and monetization, access, and capital, right? That how does this, um, that how does craft work within a kind of anti-capital methodology in which it can have limited access or could be very dear. I actually think Felicia's already talked about this because she, you balance between these dear objects and then managing to make them accessible to great things. But let's talk about this. And then another question about the kind of move to the digital, like even us here involves some serious extraction, right? Serious energies and minerals that allows these conditions to be. So perhaps we could you know, think about that and think between these kind of two questions, TJ, and see what you have to add to this. Yeah, those are complex uh, matters. Um, I, I'd like to, I think when Amalia was speaking and Gustavo, I was thinking about also, um, you know, not only the, um, the amazing opportunities that 
digitization and internet, social media and Zoom afford to uh, all of us. Um, and it's able to overcome forms of uh, um, debility or um, difficulty access. Even at the same time, it presents new barriers. And I was thinking about these two kids outside of Taco Bell in Salinas um, recently who were trying to, you know, they were trying to do their homework and they didn't have internet at their house. So they were sitting in the parking lot in order to connect. I mean, you know, um, and I'm also thinking about how Zoom has, uh, has profited. Like, I just looked it up, it was like, 458 percent since within the last year. I mean, this is part of what Naomi Klein calls the Screen New Deal. Mm -hmm. uh, how tech companies are just making a fortune off of these conditions of virtual is the virtualization or the zoomification of everything. Of course, this is a private corporate platform that we're using. So I think one um, challenge is how to how to democratize, how to increase access, how to bring a kind of digital justice. Um, to uh, these, this new media ecology that we find ourselves in. And uh, that's, an, that's, a, that's gonna be a massive challenge. But I think, you know, like PG&E, like energy utilities, I think we're finding that these resources are not something that we should oppose, rather they should be uh, freely available and you know, part of uh, everyone's um, uh, open access. So I think that's where we need to move to in terms of deprivatizing uh, social media and these kind of platform capitalist um, arenas for discussions is, is, you know, because we know how useful they are, but they can't go away. We can't go back yet. We can't continue to move to this uh, into this world of tremendous beyond grotesque economic inequality uh, that it's producing. So that that's, and we also know that it's very extractive, like the the um, the coup that took down the Evo Morales administration in Bolivia before he was brought back uh, recently um, was a lithium coup, right? This was about going after rare earth minerals like lithium that are so crucial to the digital economy. And we know that solar panels and uh, you know, a lot of the sustainable energy systems are themselves deeply extractive and they're part of a green capitalist uh, formation that also we need to think critically about. So um, yeah, so all this, this, this is, adds complexity to, to these questions, even though we wanna uh, definitely see how useful and, and um, uh, even uh, like necessary these new technologies are to the ways we're, we're living. Um, how, to, how, to de how to deal with craft and artisanal production within uh, the conditions of advanced capitalism? Um, again, that's a, a really difficult question. Uh, I think one way in is what we're hearing about through this collective conversation is that um, something that Felicia has been able to do with her practice uh, that, that I was talking about is this, you know, the way she contributes to building relationships. And maybe that's something that is really important and, and can't be or is not so easily monetized um, in the way that a, a depersonalized mass production that is, you know, globalized um, uh, does so it's it's a completely different model, and I think that's something that that uh, that artisanal craft uh, has to offer that's really precious. Uh, and maybe that there, there's something that's resistant to endless capitalist exploitation and depersonalization and, and atomization that we're also uh, confronting here. So. Um, that would be my quick answer. Answer. I don't want to take up any more time, though. And I, and actually, what I think that we could do now is, I think that Angel and Hannah, if you could talk about your commitments to craft and the kind of making of these relations that I think you're modeling too, right? So that you're going into this and you're beginning these relationships now, and then Felicia will give you the last word. So Angel and Hannah. And also, I just want to add to what TJ was just saying, and just thinking a lot about um, sort of the book as the vessel for anti capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. Especially Felicia's book, sort of the necessity of having to take out a physical object to slow production down. Um, poetry especially is anti-capitalist, um, right? We must stop and consider the poem, consider the word, consider the book object itself, mm -hmm. the tactile, all of these things. Um, and I think Felicia especially is like this embodiment of that commitment to craft. Um, and I guess I'm also just thinking about access as well, because um, 
<laughs> so we are still living in the CZU lightning complex burn scar, um, which had uh, evacuations for floods and debris flows. Um, and then uh, the hotel that we are staying in um, to escape those conditions caught fire last night. Um, and then, you know, and then you're really considering like what are resources, like what is connectivity? Um, you know, what are sort of the communities um, that one can even reach out to in these sort of times? Um, and I'm very sorry if I am not answering your question, Rachel. I, I feel like I've strayed just a little bit away from this, getting sort of bound up in the anti-capitalism of the book object itself. Um, and just thinking of this sort of continued commitment to the craft of collaboration um, and this Latinx Chicanx Poetics broadside series, especially um, being able to sort of work with this weaving of all of these energies, of all of these voices, these letters, these languages. Um, it's a multilingual collection. And, um, you know, if, if, if a fire, a flood, and a second fire cannot stop us, I do not see <laughs> parts press ever ending. Um, and, and we are very much committed to it. Um, so again, I'm very sorry if I strayed away from your question. No, I, that was great. Thank you so uh, much. So Felicia, we're out of time, but yeah. the last yeah. word. Well, um, of course, I want to thank each of you for participating, taking the time. And it's just so great to see your faces, Gustavo, Jennifer, TJ, Amalia, Angel, Hannah. And uh, I um, thanks so much to all the people, to you, Rachel, for thinking of me in this way and for Teresa Mora from the library and the librarians and the staff on the tech side. And it's just been um, such a treat. I, I, uh, I'm here in a new community. Uh, people don't know me. I'm, I'm, I'm landed in a beautiful spot with the legacy of my artist parents supporting me and their home available, thank God. And, uh, and I feel like it's really critical that I um, do my work, which is to contribute to the cultural life of the community and um in a couple years i'll have a new book that will be a mendocino poet teresa teresa whitehill and a mendocino county poet and maybe people will sit up and be aware that i'm doing this here and so uh it feeds me you know i hope it feeds the communities that i live within i hope it feeds people beyond those community the community that I know into communities I don't know. Um, I see it as an introduction. I um, And uh, I hope when I can travel again, which I don't really want to travel. I just love this. I don't really want to get on a plane ever again. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but uh, that, you know, that, that the moving parts per us, you know, will take carry the word. All of what you've been talking about, take that word out into the wide world. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Felicia. And thank you for all your years of work. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thanks, everyone. OK.